Well, today we are excited that we are kicking off our September sermon series, um, Extreme Makeover, The Life Edition. <laughs> Extreme Makeover, The Life Edition. And we believe that this month that God is getting ready to do some extreme renovation in the hearts and in the lives of his people. And so we want you to prepare yourselves for the work that is getting ready to be done in you, through you, and for you. And this is the thing about renovations. If you've ever lived in a house that was being renovated or you've ever seen a construction site, you can never really appreciate the mess. You can't appreciate the inconvenience, but you always appreciate the final product. And that's where a lot of us are in our lives right now. We are in the midst of the mess. The dust is everywhere. It seems like it's choking you. You're inconvenienced because there's tools lying everywhere. You see, uh, it's, it's, you can't have full reign and rule of your space or your house because it is being work done. But after the work is finished, you will appreciate the process. And so we're going to begin and to teach and preach today on Extreme Makeover, the life edition. You know, I love that show. How many people ever used to watch the show Extreme Makeover? I think it used to come on Sunday nights, and we used to watch it. And one thing I loved about it is they would pick a family whose house was in disarray. Three things. It was somebody from the outside who came in to fix something that the people who lived there couldn't fix. Not only did they come in to fix what they couldn't fix, but they also provided the resources for the renovation. If that is not a semblance of how God works in our lives, how he comes in and he sees things that need to be improved, fixed, torn down, blown up, uh, uh, demolished, and he comes in and he does it, he renovates us and he says, it's at no cost to you because he already paid the price. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Usually, if you see a renovation, whether it's a corporate building or a house, and there's a pause in a renovation, you know what the pause is usually for? A lack of funds. Usually, when renovation is halted, it's usually because the people that are getting the renovation does not have enough money to pay for the project to be completed. But how many people are glad that you don't have to worry about your bank account in this renovation? Because on the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid it all and he is ready to give you a divine renovation in your heart, a divine renovation in your mind, a divine renovation in your body. There there is nothing off limits for this time of renovation in your life. So I want you to put your hard hats on. I want you to put your goggles on. Do I got some goggles? Matter of fact, I'll put my tooth belt on. Let me take my cool jacket off. Come and help me take this. You got to get ready for the renovation, right? Because you can't go into a renovation haphazardly. You know, when you go to a construction site, well, help me put this on. When you go into a construction site, you always see the sign that says, wear your hard hat, right? And there's also some signs that says, enter at your own will. Because there are so many things that are happening on a construction site that if you are not prepared or privy, you are liable to get hurt. And I think that's how a lot of us are. We're going into some construction sites thinking you can DIY, do it yourself, but you don't have the tools or the qualifications good, to fix what needs to be fixed. And at the end of the day, it's more jacked up than it was when you started. How many people used to watch the Cosby show? Y'all remember when something used to break in the house, they used to always try to hide it from Bill Cosby because he would always, he thought he, he thought he could fix it all. And every time he came to fix it, it always ended up more broke than it was before he tried to fix it. And so it is with some of us, we try to fix ourselves. And I always say, if I could fix myself, I would have fixed myself a long time ago. And usually when I try to fix myself, I end up in a bigger jam than I was before. And then that's when I usually have to call in the professionals, which is the Holy Spirit, to fix what I messed up. The Holy Spirit, the outcome of this message, here's the outcome. This is the reason for divine renovation, and this is the person who's going to do it. The outcome of this message, the next four weeks, will be a, a fresh and new infilling of the Holy Spirit because he is the one who resides in this house and he knows how he wants his house to look. 
He knows how he wants it to be set up. He knows where he wants the furniture to be arranged. He knows where he wants to reside. So the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel yeah. and the ministry of encounter, is going to come in and do a divine renovation in your life. Why the Holy Spirit? Why not the Holy Spirit? He's the one is that he lives and he dwells in us. We are earthen vessels. We are the place where he abides. And I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody coming in my house telling me how to set it up. I don't want anybody coming in my house dictating where the couch is going to be. Dictating the color of my bedroom, other than my wife, because it's our house. She's the only one who can dictate to anything that happens in my house. But I don't want anybody who does not have a rightful stance in my life to determine how my house is going to be established. You have to have legal access or you have to have a rightful place to determine the reconstruction of things that are happening in my house. A lot of us have given demons and devils access to determine how your house is going to be built. You've given the enemy access to determine what's going to be set up. We've set up idols. We've set up altars. We've set up uh, uh, dysfunctional memories in bad relationships that have infiltrated our hearts. And now we got to live in a jacked up house. There's nothing worse than living in a jacked up house. I remember growing up in my, in my childhood house, there was always this window in my parents' house that was broken. And whenever we came home late, or whenever we wanted to sneak out the house, we would go to that back window and climb out of it. For 25 years, that window was still broken. And we just became okay with the broken window. Because that broken window was working for our good. That broken window was our way of escape. That broken window was our way to get out and creep. That broken window was our way to do other things we should not have done. Until that broken window stopped working for our benefit, instead of us sneaking out, somebody who shouldn't have been there snuck in. And that's how it is with our lives. Sometimes we are okay with the broken things until the broken things start to inconvenience you. Somebody help me here today. So God is coming to fix broken things in our lives. He's coming to do a divine renovation in our lives. Put the, put the graphic on the screen before I read the scripture. I want you to turn with me to Matthew, the seventh chapter. And we're going to start at the 24th verse. So you see this picture. Today's going to be full of illustrations. Isn't this a beautiful house? Can everybody see the house? It's beautiful. On the outside, the aesthetics are nice. The lights, the fixtures... The facade is great. But all it's not always, you heard them say, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? Yeah. You can't always judge how things look from the outside. Anybody from the outside would love to live here. But go to the next slide. That's nasty. Yeah, that is. In this beautiful house, you got something like a bed bug or a cockroach that has infestated this beautiful structure. Now from the outside, you would not think, you would say, these people got it all together. They got curb appeal, I mean, their lawn is cut, they got nice haircuts, they got nicely groomed hair, they put it together real nice, but on the inside of this house, there is something eating away at the inhabitants. Go to the next picture. You all get where I'm going. Another beautiful house. It's a brick building. It looks like it's built right. It's built strong. It's built where it can endure the storms and the test that comes its way. And this is what a lot of us do, especially for the strong people in here. How many people in here, everybody always think you're strong? They always think you got it all together. And usually those people who are strong, nobody ever checks to see how you are doing. Go to the next picture. But sometimes strong people have faulty foundations. I don't care what you build. If the foundation is cracked, what is built on it will definitely crumble. I'm talking about your life here. 
He's coming to do some extreme renovations in your life. A lot of us have built our houses on religious standards. We tried to meet the letter of the law. But how many people know that God is doing a new thing in our lives? It says if the old was that glorious and it came to an end, could you imagine what this new law in Christ Jesus can yield and can build in our lives? Jesus is coming to inspect our our foundation, our foundation, your foundation determines what can be built. Your foundation determines how stable you can become. Your foundation determines how high you can go. So wherever there is a faulty foundation, there will be a tilted, a slanted, a disturbed house that will never be settled unless the foundation gets fixed. I'm getting to the word. Before I get to the word, I want to set the stage for your life. Because he's coming to do an extreme makeover. Look good on the outside, faulty foundation. Next slide. Another beautiful house. Isn't it something that all of these houses are built? It looks good from the outside. It looks very nice. It's, it, it's appealing. It, it has characteristics that anybody would want. It looks like it's in a nice neighborhood. It looks like it, it, it might have some nice neighbors. It looks like they have enough property in the back. But you never know what's happening on the inside of a person. Let me say that again. You never know what's happening on the inside of a person. This beautiful house has bad plumbing. And wherever there's bad plumbing, you can't get the mess that's in you out of you. Now, this isn't a real thing. Because I always equate things with heaven. I was about to say, you about to get the plunger of heaven and plunge you. <laughs> heaven ain't got no plunger, y'all. <laughs> Beautiful house, bad plumbing. And if you know anything, and you don't want no bad plumbing in your house, water begins to sit still. And you know what still water brings... Still water brings vermin, it brings disease, it brings flies, it brings all that nasty stuff. Where your plumbing is jacked up, that house, where the value of that house goes down. Your plumbing, your ability to get rid of toxic things needs to be fixed. A lot of you are recycling toxic things in your body. If you go to the doctor and there's something wrong with your digestive system, it, it usually becomes a toxic situation that can literally take you out. And so it is in the spirit. When you have things that are unresolved, things that cannot, that it doesn't have the proper outlet or channel to be released, you will become a toxic person. Beautiful on the outside, bad plumbing on the inside. I want you in this next several weeks to take more stock and more investment on the inside than you do on the outside. It is, it is a cultural thing as a people. We don't mind spending a whole bunch of money to look good. We invest in our hair, our nails. You got your hair done, your nails done, everything done. You're fancy. You got your new J's on, you got your lashes done, you got your, your hair cut tight, and you ain't got no life insurance. If you die, you gotta go raise a GoFundMe account. I mean, you, you just look, you can't beat us, boy. We gonna step out and we gonna look. I mean, we gonna, we, gonna, we, gonna, we gonna step out and we gonna meet the par. Everybody gonna be taking pictures. But if you would take much, that much investment on your inward man, you would be great. If you would begin to invest in your soul that has been broken for the last 20 years of your life, you can live a life of peace, wholeness, and healing. Alright, let's read the scripture. <laughs> Matthew 7 and 24 and this is the parable of Jesus and Jesus was giving the parable of a man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on the sand houses look exactly the same on the outside 
But there was a difference. There was a standard that was, there was a delineation between the rock house and the sand house. Let's see what they're talking about. It says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because he had been founded on the what? The rock. He had been founded on the what? On the rock. Let's go to the next verse. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want you to highlight that last part, and great was the fall of it. I want you to highlight that. And great was the fall of it. So we have here Jesus giving an example. Whenever Jesus would teach, his parables usually had a, a meaning and an emphasis that could be applied immediately. And Jesus wanted to give those who were under the sound of his voice instructions for stability. Instructions for longevity. Instructions for being built right. And here it is. He said, it's very simple. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Paul's right there. There's another scripture that says, you have to be, be not only hearers of the word, but be ye what? Doers. Be ye what? Doers. He says, because if you are only a hearer, you are like the man who looks in the mirror, and when he leaves, he forgets what he looks like. Yes. This message, the gospel, the preaching of the truth, you get the truth every week. You get the truth in your preaching. You get the truth when you read the scripture. But this truth means nothing if you don't apply it. You can get the best word and you can get the best word from the best preacher. You can hear it from T.D. Jakes. You can hear it from anybody. But if you don't apply the word, you will be built on faulty foundation. Yes. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell. So your actions are the thing that will prevent you or that will enable you. Let me say it will enable you to endure the storms of life. Your actions, how you apply the word, how you take it in, how you, leave, how you live it, how you process it, how you eat it, and how you apply it to your life is the very thing that gives you preparation to endure the storms of life. It says, in the wind blew, in the rain fell, and all of this stuff happened, but the house was still standing. Your storm is a litmus test of how you apply the word. Wow. Regardless of what the storm may be, regardless of how ferocious it is, when you apply the scripture, the truth, the gospel, the word of God, when you apply these things, it prepares you for the storm. Yeah, I know you thought this was only to get you rich. I thought you. I know you thought this was only to, so you can live your best life now. I know you thought the word was only for your benefit, but no, it's it's to prepare you to weather the storm. Yes. How you apply the word determines if you will weather the storm. So if there's a storm brewing in your life, and a lot of us have had some bad storms, a lot of us have had some things that are hit that have hit us out of the blue. I've heard some stories and some testimonies of some tragic things that hit our lives. But the line of delineation, whether we stand or whether we fall, is how we apply the word of the Lord over our lives. And I love how Jesus teaches this parable because he puts the ball in your court. He says, you got to build your life, build your house on the rock. He says, and if you are only hearers and not doers... You will be like the second man. They called him the foolish builder. You know why they called him foolish? Somebody say why. Why? Because he had all of the tools that was necessary. He did not use them. He had all of the tools that were needed to build it, build a house on a solid foundation, 
but he did not use it. Let's keep reading. 26 verse. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now there's something about this man who built his house on the sand. And as I was reading the scripture and as I was preparing, I thought about sand. You know, nobody ever sets out to build anything that is on, 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 on sand or anything that is not solid, anything that, is, that cannot hold the weight of what is being built. But you know what sand is? Sand is broken up rock. Sand, through erosion or through the process, once, before it was eroded down, was once a solid rock. And a lot of you have tried to build something on what was once seemed to be true, but it could not endure the test in the process of life. You thought it was a rock. You built it on that relationship. You thought it was solid. Nobody could have told you that a breakup was coming, but that thing started to re-roll away. It was once a rock, and now it's sand. A lot of us built our lives around our jobs. We thought, you know, we thought this job was going to provide for us for the next 50 years of our life. It was going to retire us, and then they went bankrupt. You have built your life on something that was once truth, or you thought was true, but then the storm came to prove that it had no validity to it. And now you got to find or rebuild your house on the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus described two men who each built a house. He didn't mention any difference between their skills and their resources. The only variable he identified was where each of them were each chose to build. Jesus noted that based on their choices, one man was wise and the other was foolish. Based on their choices, one man was wise and the other man was foolish. I said this and it's so true. You are only as delivered as your decisions. We, everybody in here, are a sum total of the decisions that we choose to make. The only difference between the wise builder and the foolish builder was their decision on where they were going to build. My God today. God is looking for somebody to make a decision for him. You are able, I love the scripture, I love this. It says, if your strength fails in the day of adversity, you following me? I want to make sure you follow me before I tell you the next part. You following me? If your strength fails in the day of adversity, you were never strong. I'm going to let that sink in. If your strength fails in the day of adversity, your strength was an illusion. Anybody can be strong in good times. Anybody can be strong when a challenge comes and you have the weight or the strength to overcome that challenge. That means your strength was, uh, was able to accommodate the threat or the challenge at hand. But there comes a time in your life where you don't have the strength to overcome and endure the challenge that is facing you in your life. And that storm is only there to let you know, here it goes, you got to get your weight up. That storm is there to tell you, yeah, your decisions in the past were all right, but in this next level of building, and this next level of being becoming who I have ordained for you to be, your decisions have to match your destiny. Your decisions, some of our decisions still match our past. We still making decisions like we ain't got nothing on the line. What do I look like still making a decision like I'm not a pastor? My God. Now, it's okay for you, but how would you feel if I made a decision on a Saturday night at 1 o'clock in the morning to go to the club and shake what I got on the dance floor? Sir. And I might scoot up to one of y'all and y'all look like, whoa, this is my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Some of y'all be like, hey, bastard. Some of y'all be like, nah, I can't do this. <laughs> I have to make a decision based on my destiny and not solely based on my feelings. A wise master builder makes, he, he deciphers, he sifts every decision based on what God has called you to be, based on who he is making you to become. What kind of decisions are you making in your life? I need some of us, and, and this might sound real harsh, I need us to stop making such stupid decisions. I, you notice I said us, right? I ain't just talking about you. I don't want you to say this man pointing the finger. I need us to stop making such flagrant decisions that can literally sabotage your destiny. I'm sure when the builder, the foolish man who built on the sand, I'm sure he thought he was going to be able to live in this house for a very long time. For at least 20 years, he was probably going to get married, raise his kids, retire, live in that house. But he did not build it in a way that could sustain his life. You have to be able to be built in a way that your life can be sustained. It would have been so the man who built a house on the rock. Do you know that building something on a solid foundation is a challenge? Because you have to have something that's going to penetrate the rock. When, when, they're, when, when, when architects or contractors are building on solid foundation, they have the tools that can go deep. They have the, the tools that can break up the cement. They have the tools that can, that can latch on to something so that it can be built up. So building on solid foundation requires a little more work. Where you can use a shovel on soft things, you got to use a jackhammer on hard things. <laughs> Some of us need the jackhammer of God in your life. Amen. Now that's the real thing. He talks about how the hammer of his word is coming. Yes. <laughs> so our lives, you need to utilize the right tools. You see this wonderful, all this wonderful, beautiful chaos. But you really don't realize that this is all organized chaos. There is a purpose to this chaos. There is a blueprint that is coming out of all this mess. There is an expected end out of all of these random materials. But just by the naked eye, you can't see anything good coming out of this mess. You don't see anything productive coming out of empty paint cans, a jacked up table, and a drill that seems to have no power in it and a jackhammer. It just looks like a bunch of random tools. But the beauty of God being the architect and the builder of our lives, he'll take the jackhammer, I mean, he'll take the sledgehammer, he'll take the screwdriver, and he'll begin to work at you. He'll begin to go away and pounding at your life. And he says he's getting ready to make something beautiful out of this mess. <laughs> It seems like some of us have been in renovation for a very long time. You know what can shorten the length of time that you're under renovation, at least for a season? Is your submission. Yes. Yes. Your obedience. Somebody say obedience. obedience. I promise you ain't a curse word. I know everybody growing in here. <laughs> Somebody say obey the word. Obey the word. Your obedience gives God, it gives God compliance yes. and liberty to come in and do the work in your life. Some of y'all run from this sledgehammer. You're like, mm -mm, ain't nobody going to hit me with that. I don't want God coming in my life, busting up my sacred cow. I don't know what your sacred cow is. I don't know what your pet demon is. I don't know what the stronghold in your mind may be. Because a lot of us have lifted up wicked imaginations that have exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And we've become okay with it. You know why? Because you get so used to dysfunction. Just like I got used to that broken window in my house. A lot of us, when you live in a place for so long, you stop seeing it as broken. And you start seeing it as, oh, that's just what it is. It is so true. Have you ever been to a place, a church, or your house, where there's a picture that's been hanging there for 25 years, and it's so dusty, but nobody don't think to dust it? That picture been hanging there since you was born, and it's still crooked. It's been crooked for 30 years, and ain't nobody thought to straighten that picture up. 
That's how it is in our lives with dysfunction. We get so used to dysfunction that it don't look crooked no more. It don't got a bunch of dirt on it anymore. It just is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I've been feeling this way for a long time, but it just is what it is. Yeah, everybody get depressed every now and then, but that depression stops being every now and then and it becomes consistent. It just is what it is. Uh-oh. Yeah, I hear voices, but they don't talk to me all the time. It just is what it is. Yeah, all my relationships been jacked up. That's why I ain't married. Nah, I ain't done talking about me, baby. I'm using that as an example. That's why I ain't married yet. I can't find nobody who is good enough for me. No, 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 baby. You just crazy. No, no, no. You just have not done what you need to do to build your life up to be a husband and a wife. You don't want this sledgehammer to come cracking down in your life. But he has the tools that are necessary to break up those hard places in your life. He got the tools. He got what's needed. He says, I'm coming to do away with the faulty areas of your life. He's not just concerned about your outward appearance. When the prophet uh, Samuel went to go anoint a king, they brought all the good looking men out. They brought the, the tall ones out, the one with the muscles, the one who had the look. And, 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 and Samuel said, the, the Lord spoke to Samuel, he says, God don't look on man like we do. He doesn't look on the outward, he looks on the inward. And this extreme renovation has nothing to do with your outside first. He builds you from the inside out. He builds you from the inside out. And if you were wise, which I believe I'm standing in front of a bunch of wise people. People that are maturing in the things of God. Somebody say, he's talking about me. If you don't say it, they're going to think you ain't wise. So say it. Say, he's talking about me. I believe I'm standing in front of a bunch of men and women who are becoming wise in the things of God and you are prepared to allow the Lord to put a sledgehammer to the foolishness in your lives. He's coming to bring corrective measures on the inside of you. Your insides begin to start to show up on the outside. Remember the beautiful house with bad plumbing? I guarantee you. That plumbing ain't fixed. It been, uh, soon enough, eventually that house is going to start smelling really bad. Yes. That plumbing is going to start showing up in the front lawn. My God. Some of y'all, y'all don't want your mess showing up in your front lawn. You better get that. You better allow the Holy Ghost to fix the plumbing in your life so your mess don't show up in your front lawn. You know what? God, God just doesn't expose people right away. I want, to, I want you to hear this. And I learned this. Thank God for his grace in my life when I needed it. Woo. Now I still got his grace, but it's for something different. Somebody say, thank God for his grace. You know why? Because his grace has been dealing with you in the private places. His grace has been dealing with you behind closed doors. But there comes a time where he says, you're not receiving my love in this way. So I got to love you another way. So you can stop being foolish. I'm going to allow your junk to show up on your front lawn. So God is coming. This month, he is here to do some extreme renovation in our lives. The only difference between the man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on the sand was his decision. And his willingness to do the work to build on a hard place. Are you willing to be built in the hard places? <laughs> yes, God. Are you willing to do the work that is necessary to be built on a solid and firm foundation? If you take the easy route, what you built is going to collapse. If you take the easy route, just looking good on the outside and jacked up on the inside, you won't last. God is coming to build you from the inside out. You can't, you can't appreciate all of this. You can't appreciate the sledgehammer. You can't appreciate the chaos that is here. But when you allow God to build you, he takes chaotic things and he makes them beautiful. He takes broken things and he makes them whole again. 
The building process is not always a convenient process. The building process, the extreme makeover. I've seen one episode where after they were done, it looked like a completely different house. I mean, they renovated the inside, the outside, everything. It did not look like the same place. Now, I said that to say this. A lot of us have to become okay with not being who we thought we were. There was a point in my life I thought I was this, I thought I was that. And then God started to do some renovation on me. And I'm like, whoa, I kind of missed that. And a lot of us just said, well, that's just me. That's just how I am. And when people tell me that's just me, I'll be like, well, you just be you for the next 20 years of your life, and I'm going to go this way. Because usually people that say that's just me, they end up being stuck. There's this uh, family member of mine, growing up, she had a bad attitude. I mean, just, just mean. Why are you mean? I mean, why are you just mean to people? And I, and I would always talk to her and be like, yo, you can't be mean like that. You supposed to be saved, you're supposed to love God, and you know, you got good things going on. She said, well, that's just me. And the, that moment the Holy Ghost said, then her being her, she's going to be bound for the next 20 years of her life. Because she was not willing to allow God to make her into what he desired for her to be. She, re, she, she embraced more so her dysfunction than she embraced his function for her life. Yeah, there's a function. Even dysfunction has function. That's why it's called dysfunction. But it's working against you. It's counterproductive. So we have to, 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 to not embrace the dysfunction and say, okay, God, I'll allow you to, I'll allow your function to be pre prevalent in my life. So you see the mess. And a lot of us stop allowing God to build us because it's just too messy. Makeovers are messy. I know you've been saved and I know you know faith. You know the kingdom, you know the rules of God, you know the scripture, but if your life, and, and there's no, no condemnation, if your life is not measuring up to what you think you know in your mind, something's not right. There is a disconnect. In psychology, they call it a cognitive dissonance. They say you know something, but there's a dissonance between what you know and what you experience. There's a breaking between how you know it to be and what's actually happening in your life. He's coming to fill the gap of the dissonance. What you know he wants you to experience. So don't be discouraged because of the mess. Somebody come in. Take this off for me. Don't take it off fast. Take it off slow. All of this. These are all the materials that are used to make you beautiful again. These are all the materials that are used to make you whole again. These are all the materials that are used in your life to begin to beautify you from the inside out. Now, in construction sites, you usually got people yelling. You got loud tools that are working. You got people all over the place. I know you're saying, how did they get that out of that? I mean, they worked real hard. I mean, they bit the wood. They painted the pillows, painted the material. They built all of that from that because ultimately this, it has not always been this. It was once this. This paint can had to paint this to make it beautiful. The hammer had to break the wood so that the wood can be pliable to be turned into this. Are you, are you pliable enough for the Holy Spirit to take what was once a mess to turn into what's now a beauty? My are you hearing me? Yeah. Am I teaching okay? Yeah. Am I speaking English? Yeah. I'm not speaking no other language. Yeah. <laughs> Catch myself. <laughs> I want to make sure you are understanding the words that are coming out of my mouth. That you might be looking a hot mess right now, but if you stay in the process, he'll turn you into something beautiful. He gives you beauty for ashes, sorrow for joy. This is the extreme makeover that God is coming to make and to build in your life. He's coming to fix the plumbing in your life. He's coming to get rid of the critters that have infestated your soul. My, I think this is going to be a lot of deliverance this, this month too. Amen. 
Before the Holy Spirit can come and dwell, he's about to clean house. I know we miss spring cleaning. It is now. It's really summer, but it feels like fall. But he's coming to clean house right now. He's coming to sweep your house clean. And let me, let me, let me qualify you for this. I'm about to qualify you. Every year of my life, I'm experiencing some type of deliverance. Amen. Christine, your pastor is not exempt from having his house cleaned out. He is not exempt from, uh, 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 if you, let me say it like this. If you say you cleaned your house and the only room you cleaned is your kitchen, you did not clean your house. You cleaned the kitchen. <laughs> you know you really clean your house when you go into the closets. And you start throwing stuff away. And you start organizing things. That's when you really clean the house. God ain't just worried about your kitchen. He ain't just worried about your living room. Because you can straighten that up or just dim the lights when people come over. You can trick them. They can say, oh, their house is nice and clean. When they leave you, turn that light up. Stuff start running around. You see all the dust everywhere. He is coming to clean out the closets of your soul. Those dark places, those hidden places, those places where you always throw the junk in. When you clean up your house, you just throw stuff in the closet. And he said, listen, I don't want to come and dwell in a place. I don't have any closet. The worst thing for me is no closet space. And I think me and the Holy Spirit got some similarities. He wants some closet space. He wants to come and clean out the crevices and the dark places of your life. And this is what's getting ready to happen. Let's all stand to our feet. Don't get stuck or don't abandon the process. Don't abandon the process. I know you look like this right now. But it's getting ready to turn into something beautiful. I was talking, I, I, this is, um, I have my, one of my oldest sisters. I remember she was just struggling in a certain area of her life. She's my oldest sister. We were growing up in the church and and my particular persuasion, we sometimes we had to tarry for the Holy Ghost. We had to sit down on our knees, get down on our knees, and just call on them and call on them until something happened. We frothing at the mouth, convulsing. She was like, you know, I don't understand why I don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't understand what's wrong with me. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Why doesn't he give me the break that he gave you? Why doesn't he come in like he came in for you? Why doesn't he, why doesn't, a lot of us have been asking the why does he not? Why isn't God doing this? Why isn't it turning out like this? I thought he said this. Why hasn't he performed this? And what God is saying to you is just be patient in the process. You are in the middle stages from here to there. You are in the middle stages of from being here discombobulated. All the materials that are needed to make this, they're here, but you couldn't see. You couldn't see the good of the mess to get here. You have everything that it takes to be built right. You have everything that it takes to be built according to the design of heaven for your life. But the question is, Will you allow him to do the work? Hallelujah. And I want to speak to the religious folk first. Because sometimes religious folk are the ones who miss it first. Because you've been in church so long. Because you read this. You read that book. And you heard this book. And you watched that YouTube video. I don't care how mature or how far you are in your life. Sometimes your house still needs an upgrade. Yeah. Somebody say, upgrade me, God. Upgrade me, God. Sometimes things get outdated. My fixtures are outdated. It looks like the 1980s. I need to be updated. Don't allow what you think you know to allow you to miss what God is doing now. He's looking to renovate. He's looking to do an extreme makeover. One of my favorite things is when they go and tear down walls to make more space. He's coming to tear down some walls. He's coming to make some space so that he can dwell. Let's lift up our hands. So take everything I don't want it. I don't need it. Take everything, everything. 
I believe that God is taking his sledgehammer and he hasn't even begun to do construction yet. He's just surveying the land. He's walking around. Got his hands on his head. He's like, yeah, I'm going to tear this wall down. I'm going to put this light up here. I'm going to put this here. And oh, this is going to be looking real good today. He's taking a step back and just looking at it. He's looking at the mess of a lot. He's like, yeah, I can see something out of this. I can see something good coming out of this mess. And I want you to know that God is saying that about you. He says, I can see something good coming out of this mess. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God sees you beyond your faults? I'm glad about it. Aren't you glad that he sees you beyond your mess? He says, if you would give me access, I'm going to take the mess of your life and make it something beautiful. And not only is he coming to make some things beautiful, but he's coming in the midst of making things beautiful. He's coming to demolish, to break down, to tear down, and to pull up, to uproot. Then he's coming to plant, he's coming to build, he's coming to establish in your life. There's some of you where your construction process has been stunted, it's been halted, and you've been in the same place for the past few years or a few months. And you said to yourself, I should be much further than I am right now. I should be much further than I am right now. I want you to know that upon your submission to the Lord, your yes to God, He will pick up right where He left off. To some of us, I hear him say, I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the devourer of your life has eaten away at. So, Father, I thank you. You said, Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made. Thank you, Father, for even though the dust is everywhere, even though the loudness of the construction is deafening, that we would embrace the process and we would allow you to build us and to make us into what you have desired for us to be. Father, we say yes. I want you to say yes, Father. I want you to have your way in my life. Build me. Shape me. Mold me into what you desire for me to be.